Well, hello there. Hello. You may applaud now. <laughs> Good evening, and welcome to the South Baldwin Community Theater's 2020 Radio Theater Festival. Thank you for coming out tonight. It's show three, and uh, we weren't expecting a huge crowd here on March 1st because so many snowbirds go home. How many of you have gone home? No way. <laughs> uh, how many of you are not from the state of Alabama? We've been asking this. Oh, why do you still fight you? In that case, I'm not going to read the program to you. I figure you can handle that. Oh, being from Alabama, I get to tell that joke, and now I've told it six times. <laughs> uh, folks, we do want you to have a good time tonight. We want you to laugh anywhere you feel like laughing, and, uh, and really enjoy this show. Now, here's another question that I've asked of each audience. How many of you remember the golden age of radio? I see a few hands, a few hands. Some of you listened to this when you were kids. Well, I don't need to tell you how good it is, and we're going to bring it right back to you tonight. Uh, before I talk about that, I want to mention that we do have some exits in case of emergency. I'm required to tell you there is an exit there. It goes straight out to another exit, and you are outside. You can go straight out this door to the lobby doors, and you are outside. If you are coughing or sneezing or wheezing or otherwise have to make a, an exit in the course of the show, please use that exit back there unless you're right here uh, in this front section, in which case you can go over that way. If you are coughing or sneezing or wheezing due to coronavirus, I ask you to use the exits right now. <laughs> Folks, we are so happy to have you here tonight. Tonight you will see After the Thin Man, which is a great screwball detective mystery from the 1930s. That's going to be in the second act. In the first act coming up, it will be Dragnet, and you are going to love the radio recreation of Dragnet from the 1940s. And we start the show with that quarreling couple, the Vickersons, and we start right now. Ladies and gentlemen, like most married women, Blanche Vickerson is a romanticist, having talked poor husband John into taking her on a second honeymoon. Three o'clock in the morning finds Miss Vickerson in the lobby of a small hotel in Niagara Falls. Exhausted and bleary-eyed from the long drive, John Vickerson unloads the luggage outside while his wide-eyed wife talks to the night clerk. Let's listen in. <coughs> it doesn't really matter about the room as long as we have a nice view of the falls. Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. I bet you don't remember me. Uh, no, ma'am. Well, I wouldn't expect you to. With all the honeymoon couples you see, I was here seven years ago. Is that so? Yes. Well, better luck this time. <laughs> oh, we're still married to each other. We're just having a second honeymoon. Do many people do that? Uh, no, ma'am. I wonder why not. I wouldn't know. Are you married? No, ma'am. Uh, arthritis makes me walk this way. <laughs> Will you please just sign the register for me? Oh, I'm sorry. Last time we were here, we had to wait two days for a room. We stayed in a motel in Buffalo. <laughs> oh, here you are. Thank you. Uh, is that Bickerson? Well, yes. Didn't I sign it right? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Mrs. John Bickerson and husband... <laughs> Here's the key, room 318. There's an automatic elevator over there. We don't have any bellboys at night. Oh, that's all right. I'll go out to the car and get my husband. John! Where is he? He's not in the car. Wonder, wonder if he took the luggage out of the trunk. 
wouldn't hurt you to look at them either. I see them every day on the shredded wheat box. <laughs> <laughs> How can you be so cynical? I'm glad I have a little romance in my soul. Just the sight of those falls brings back memories. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sit up, John. Look at that cascade. Doesn't it remind you of something? Yeah. What, son? I think I left the water running in the bathtub. <laughs> John, you didn't. Oh, okay, I didn't. Good night, Blanche. I never should have trusted you to lock up. Now I'm really worried. Did you close all the windows? I closed the windows. You didn't leave any lights burning, did you? No. Did you leave food for the cat? Left it up for a week. Well, what did you leave him? A six-pound tin of corned beef. Did you empty it into a plate? No. Well, how do you expect the cat to eat it? I left the can opener on top. <laughs> I mean, stop worrying about the cat. We should have taken all the animals with us. Poor little canary locked in the cage. Cat can't get out of the house. And who is going to feed the goldfish? I'll bet they're terribly unhappy. Oh, they're not unhappy. They're having a fine vacation. They are not. They are, too. When I left, the cat was fishing. <laughs> fishing? Yeah, in a goldfish bowl. He was using the canary as bait. Oh, John Bickerson! Go to sleep. The canary and the goldfish are fine. I wish the cat was left dead. <laughs> Don't talk like that. I love that cat. When I get home, I'm going to enter him in a cat show. What for? He couldn't win anything. Well, maybe not. But he'd need a lot of nice cats. Oh, go to sleep, will you, Blanche? I'm not sleepy. Why don't you sit up and talk to me? Blanche, people don't talk at 4 o'clock in the morning. He talked until 5 o'clock on our first honeymoon. <laughs> he kept reciting poetry and telling me how beautiful I was. Do you remember what you said, John? No. You told me your love for me was like a raging inferno. You said you had a fierce fire blazing in your breast like a live coal. What's happened to it, John? It's only a clinker now. <laughs> <laughs> How can you say such terrible things to me? Blanche, I'm so sleepy, I don't know what I'm saying. I'd like to hear you say things like that to Gloria Gooseby. Gloria Gooseby? Oh, I can't even go to Niagara Falls without Gloria Gooseby. The only reason you didn't was because she wouldn't have you. What? You proposed to her 15 times before she, because she wouldn't have you. 15 times before you proposed to me, you big second fiddle, you. I never proposed to Gloria Gooseby, and you know it. The next time I see her, I'm going to punch her husband, Leo, right in the nose. What have you got against Leo? He's a better husband than you are. I'm sick of hearing that, too. Leo Gooseby is a cheap, chiseling bomber. He is not. He's more generous than you. Oh, would Leo Gooseby give you a new dress? No. Would he give you a new hat? No. Would he give you a mink coat? No. Would you give me a mink coat? No. <laughs> Why should I give you anything that Leo would? Stop screaming. You'll wake up the whole hotel. Well, stop goading me. You want me to do nothing but fight, fight, fight. No, I don't. All I do is ask for proof you love me, and you go into a tantrum. Blanche, what more proof do you want? I tell you a thousand times a day. I, I raise a new crop of freckles to spell out I love you. I, I painted it on all the Burma shade signs. Somebody's at the door, John. Honey. 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 Honey! Madam! This is not a beehive. It's my bedroom. What are people wandering around the halls this time of night for? Broken down hotel. Don't be so crabby. It's probably some nice little bride who can't find her husband. Maybe he's lost. He isn't lost. He's hiding. <laughs> Put out the lights, will you, Blanche? I have got a bite headache. Nobody told you to yell your brains out. Good night. If you just stand here and look at the falls for a few minutes, your headache will go away and you'll sleep fine. Mm -hmm. Where does all that water come from? I once read it goes over at a rate of 346,000 gallons a second. Don? Yeah? Are the falls higher on the American side or the Canadian side? I don't know. 
I'll have to find out in the morning. What a majestic spectacle. I'm convinced there's nothing in the world like Niagara Falls. Except you, Blanche. Really, Tom? Why do you say that? Because you never dry up either. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, John. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet is brought to you by Chesterfield, made by Liggett and Myers, first major tobacco company to bring you a complete line of quality cigarettes. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a juvenile detail. Four children in your city have apparently been abandoned by their mother. There's no trace of the woman's whereabouts. There's a possibility of foul play. Your job, investigate. Today, you hear these three words everywhere. Chesterfields, for me. The cigarette tested and approved by 30 years of scientific tobacco research. Chesterfields, for me. The cigarette with a proven good record with smokers and the first cigarette to have such a record. Chesterfields, for me. Chesterfields give you proof of highest quality and low nicotine. The taste you want, the mildness you want. The Chesterfield you smoke today is the best cigarette ever made and best for you. <laughs> said I was supposed to give you a hand on anything that might come up. Then you just made it. Hmm? Woman in the next office, you better talk to her. What's it about? You better get a straight from her. You better if you got a straight from her. Who is she, a prank? I don't think so. See what you can figure. All right. Miss Edmonds? Yes, Miss Garland. Are you leaving to get your basket? I'd like you to meet Sergeant Friday. Joe, this is Miss Eggers. How do you do? Miss Eggers? If you give him the story the way you told it to me, you bet I will. Sit down, young man. I'll tell you all about it. All right. Get your book out. I beg your pardon? Your book. You're going to take notations, aren't you? Well, if you just tell me what this is all about. Yeah. Well, I don't want you to get the idea that I'm the nosy type. I'm not. It's just that I take an interest in the things that go on around me. Civil-minded, the way they put in the papers. Uh-huh. Of course, there are people who say that I pay too much mind to their business, oh, but it isn't true. Not a bit of it. If you tell the sergeant what happened. Oh, yeah. Well, these people moved into the house uh, about six months ago. The five of them. Yes, ma'am. Stevie, Pamela, Carol, Martin, and the mother Rowena. Four kids and the mother. All right. Would you like to go on? Well, now right off. I could spot this woman. Seen a lot of them. How do you mean that, Mrs. Eggers? Uh, you can make it crystal if it's any easier. Yes, ma'am. But what did you mean, you've seen a lot of them? Elkies. You know. Drunks. Mm-hmm. Well, she's one. I could spot it right off. Her and those four beautiful children. Yes. 
first few months they live here, I maybe see her a couple of times a week, you know, going in the house or coming out, just a couple of times a week. I see. Last week, uh, 10 days. I haven't seen her at all. Not even a little sight. Now, right after they moved in, little Stevie, well, he's 11, he came around to the back door and asked if there was anything he could do for me. You know, sweep up the leaves on the lawn, empty out the garbage, you know, things like that. Whenever I had something, I always let him do it. He used to pay him a nickel or a dime. Yeah. The last week I've been giving him kind of a little plate of lunch, too. That's what really told me there was something wrong. That plate of lunch. I don't understand. Well, I don't have any children of my own. But my sister, she's got five of them. And once in a while, a couple of them will come to visit with their Aunt Crystal. A young man I know, too. Isn't enough food in the world to fill him up. None of them. Except Stevie. He never ate the food at my house. Always took the plate over to his plate. Brought back the dish. He never took a mouthful of food at my plate. Mm -hmm. So right off, I figured that something was wrong. That's the way it looks to me. What about the children's father? Where's he? Mm -hmm. We've never seen him. I think he either died or, or him and Rowena got a divorce or something. Never seen him. Matter of fact, I ain't seen the other three kids last week. I guess they just stay in the house all the time. Never see them out in the yard playing or acting like kids. All right, thank you, Mrs. Eggers. We'll check on the house right away. That's what I wanted this police woman to do. Told her I'd go right along with you. Well, that won't be necessary. Oh, listen, young man. If there's anything wrong with them kids, I want to know about it. I want to do my part. The whole neighborhood's is that right? Sure. Little Stevie comes to all the houses looking for something to do, asking for work. It just seems to me that there's something wrong about that whole caboodle of them. Not seeing the mother and the way the boys don't eat the lunch plate. Not seeing the other kids. There's something that don't fit over there. All right, ma'am. We look right into it. You just do that. You'll see what I say is true. Thank you, Miss Eggers. Well, don't go thanking me. Just trying to be sober minded. That's all. Mm -hmm. Just seems that there isn't anybody who cares about those kids. That's not true, Mrs. Eggers. What? We do. 8.14 p.m. Policewoman Irene Gardner and I left the office and drove over to the address the Eggers woman had given us. The house was a small, one-story clapboard building located on the rear of the lot. The front yard was overgrown with weeds, and there were neighborhood advertised papers laying around. When we arrived, there was a faint light on in one of the front rooms. Irene and I went up to the front door and we knocked. We got no answer. I tried the door, but we found it locked. There was no sound from inside the place. The shades were drawn over the window so that it was impossible for us to see into the house. We walked around to the rear and tried the back door. It's locked. Yeah, doesn't look like anybody's home. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk to that Edgar's room again, huh? All right. Doesn't make a lot of sense, though, does it? The story she gave us, the kids should be at home. Well, she might be seeing things, Joe. You know, trying to figure something way to get attention. Yeah, it might be. Didn't seem like that to me, though. Joe? What? What do you got there? Front window. There she is. Yeah. Uh, there's somebody in there. Come on, let's go. I'll try it again. Yeah. Not answering. Come on, open up in there. We know you're in there. Come on, open the door. What do you want? Police officers, let us in. There's nothing wrong. Go away. No, we can't do that. Now, come on, open up. Who you gonna arrest? Nobody. We just want to talk to you. You sure that's all? That's right. Okay, just a minute. What do you want? You have a help. I haven't done anything wrong. We didn't say you did. Then what are you doing around here? What are you looking for? Your mother? What? Is your mother home? Well, yeah, she's here. Well, we'd like to see her, if that's all right. We can't. We can't see her. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to. She's lying down, asleep. That's why you can't talk to her. Well, what's the matter, little girl? Nothing. Why do you ask something like that? Don't you think you better let us in? We're going to have to talk to your mother. But she's asleep. She's tired. You can't talk to her. You can't. Now, come on. Uh, you want to go and wake her up? There's some things we need to talk to her about. I wonder if we can come in. It's kind of wet out here. 
And then you can get your mother and we can have our talk, huh? I guess you can come in. I guess it's all right. Come on in, Joe. Yeah. The front room was about 12 feet square. The only light in the room came from a candle and a jelly glass on the table. The only furniture in the place was the table that held the candle and a torn artificial leather and chrome couch. The floor was covered with paper, rain-soaked cardboard boxes and dirty clothes. At a half dozen different places, drops of dirty water were seeping through the roof. The water was being caught in empty tin cans that had been placed around the room. To the left was a door to a bedroom. In it, in a wooden crib, were two children. From the descriptions we'd gotten from the Eggers woman, we recognized them as Martin Telford, age four, and his sister Carol, age two. As soon as the children saw Irene and me, they hid their heads under the dirty blanket that covered the crib. There was nothing else in the room except a dirty mattress lying on, on the floor in one corner. From the appearance of the bedding, it hadn't been laundered or changed in at least three weeks. On the other side of the house, a small kitchen was piled high with dirty dishes, pieces of rotting food, and empty tin cans. The plumbing in the house had apparently been out of order for several weeks. While Irene and I looked over the house, the girl who had met us at the door, Pamela Pelton, followed us. When we got back to the front room, she started to cry. <laughs> oh, all right, you, you want to tell us where she is? Come on, Pamela, it's, it's not as bad as all that, is it? Here, here's a handkerchief. Here you are. Now, where's your mother? She's out looking for a job. It's kind of late for that, isn't it? I don't know. That's what she's doing, though. Out looking for a job. You know, why'd you tell us she was here tonight? Because I didn't know what you wanted. I thought you were trying to arrest her. Why'd you think that? Because that's what she said. Your mother said that? Yeah, she told us that police had arrested people. She told us about it, how he wants this to her. Your mother's been arrested? Yes. You know why? Well, she was. Well, what for? You know? She got sick. She got sick and they put her in jail. Hmm. That's why I told you that she was asleep. I thought you'd go away and leave us alone. It's just cold in here. Yeah. You're having heat in the house, Pamela. There was a heater in the bedroom. I'll turn it on. Good. It doesn't work. What? The heater doesn't work. Marty was playing with it one day and he broke the little rods in it. It doesn't work anymore. You should be able to get some heat out of it. No, you won't. There isn't any gas. They turned it off. Mm-hmm. Well, I think uh, maybe you youngsters better come downtown with us, don't you think? Why? Well, it'll be warm down there. It's a lot more comfortable for you. We can't go. We gotta wait here. That's all right, Pamela. We'll leave word for your mother where you are. We still can't go. We gotta be here when she comes home. She'll be pretty mad if we aren't here. We gotta stay. We'll explain it to her. Irene? Yeah? You wanna call the crime lab, have them come out, and uh, get some pictures of the place? Right. You want to get your brother and sister ready? We're not going. I'm sorry, honey, but there's not much you can do about it. Can you ask your mother now? No, please. Who are you? He's a policeman. What do you want? There's nothing wrong here. Nothing for you to come butting in for. You want to see your mother, son? She hasn't done anything. Why don't you cops just leave her alone? All the time you're after her. You never leave her alone. Why don't you just leave her alone? You bring something to eat, Steve? Mister? What's that, son? You better get out of here. And don't call me son. What's the matter, Steve? Why are you acting like this? Because I don't like cops, that's why. You got no right to come in here. Like this. No right at all. We ain't done nothing. We're not bothering nobody. We're not causing any trouble. Now, leave us alone. You're looking for mom, Steve. I figured that. She's not here. Now, get out. Her mother's on the way, Joe. Hi, you're Steve, aren't you? You a cop, too? I'm a police woman, yes. I just told your friend to get out. Uh, you can put the same thing on. You're kind of rough for a little guy, aren't you? That's none of your business. Oh, I know my rights. Oh, I know I'm good. Well, look here, son. We're going to take you downtown, give you a good meal, uh, just until we can talk to your mother, that's all. Then you're going to bring us back? Uh, we'll see. How about Marty and Carol? Are you taking them, too? Yeah. Going to give them something to eat? Yeah, that's right. Okay, we'll go with you. Just for tonight, though. That's all. Just for tonight. You understand? Yeah. Oh, and another thing? Yeah, what's that? We're paying our own way. Oh, I've got money. Anything you give us, we're going to pay for it. You don't have to do that, son. Well, I'm going to. We don't need charity. We're getting along all right. Everybody has a little rough luck now and then. Everybody. Mom tries. She really does. She's been looking for a job for a long time. Uh -huh. All right, Steve. Uh, you want to help the others get ready to leave? 
I'm not sure we can go. Well, I'm afraid you're going to have to, Sonia. All right. Just for tonight. But the only reason is that I want Marty and Carol and Pamela to have something hot to eat. But there's something wrong with the stove, so we can't cook on it. That's the only reason we're going, because there's something wrong with the stove. The gas is turned off. No, it isn't. It just don't work. But whatever we need, whatever we get, we're going to pay for it. I got the money. Well, now, I told you once before, that won't be necessary. It is, too. We're not taking any charity. We've never taken any, and we're not going to start now, either. Anything that's done for us is going to be paid for. Yeah, I guess that's right, Steve. Huh? It'll be paid for. Eight fifty-six p.m. Men from the crime lab arrived and photographed the entire house. The pictures were held for evidence. A search of the house showed that there was no food for the children. In a cardboard box in the bedroom, under a pile of toilet articles, we found a photograph of a man and a woman taken at what appeared to be a beach photographer's. Irene and I checked through the rest of the house but found nothing that would indicate where the mother of the four Telford children had gone. The youngsters were taken to juvenile hall, bathed, given clean clothes, and fed. At first, Steve Telford refused to eat anything until he was assured that his two sisters and his brother were, were being given the same kind of food. After the boy had finished eating, Irene and I talked to him. His previous uncooperative attitude had changed, and he seemed anxious to help us find his mother. This is the longest she's ever been gone. I'm beginning to think that there might be something wrong. Well... When did you see her last, Steve? This is Friday, isn't it? Yes, February 8th. Uh-huh. Maybe it was last Tuesday, then. You mean this week, son? No, a week ago. A week ago, Tuesday. So, what'd she say when she left? Just like always. She said she wasn't feeling very good, and she was going to go out and try to look for work. What kind of work does she do? She's a waitress. Good one, too. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. That's the trouble, I guess. She's so good. What do you mean? Well, there are only a couple places that Mom says are any good. Well, you know, where she'd want to work. I don't believe I understand what you mean, Steve. Well, Mom always says that she wasn't just a hash winner. That's what she called it. Oh, I see. She said that she was a waitress and she couldn't go to work just any place. Mm -hmm. uh, where'd she work last? A big place out in Beverly Hills. I forgot the name of it right now. Um, but when she got the job, before she went to work, Mom took us out there. We didn't go in, but we stood in front and looked in. Big place. Real nice, you know. All kind of glass in the front. You could see the people inside having a good time. We didn't go in, but we could see it good. How long did your mother work there? Well, she had some trouble, and she had to quit. What do you mean, trouble? She got sick, and the man who was her boss got mad at her, and I guess he said a lot of things that Mom didn't like. So Mom told him that he couldn't talk to her like that, and then she quit. Did your mother ever tell you uh, what was wrong with her? Steve? No, she didn't. Did you see a doctor about it? You might as well know. You're going to find out anyway. What's that, son? Well, Mom drank a lot. Sometimes she drank too much, and then she'd get sick. That's what was wrong. Uh -huh. Where's your father, Steve? He died before Carol was born. Right before. I want you to take a look at a picture for us, will you? And look at it and tell us if you know the man who's in it. All right. Here you are. That's Mom. Mm -hmm. You know the man? No, I don't think I've ever seen him before. Your mother have any men friends? No, I don't think so. At least she never told me about him. She, uh, she said that the kids were enough for her, that we were all that mattered. She used to say that when she got a steady job, we were all going to live good. She used to tell us how one day the phone would ring and all our troubles would be over. Just like that. One day we'd have a little trouble, and then the next, everything was going to be all right. Mm -hmm. She really believed it, too. Just all of a sudden, the phone was going to ring, and all of our troubles would be over. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to tell her. Tell her what, son? That they turned the phone off. We had the name Rowena Telford checked through r and I. And we found that the boy's story was true. The woman had been arrested once on a charge of 4127A LAMC, being drunk in a public place. Irene put in a call to the waitresses' union and asked them to check and see if the woman was working any place in town. They came back with the information that the last job she'd held had been six months before, and that she'd been fired for insubordination for being drunk. We showed the picture of the man and woman that was found at the Telford home around the department in hopes that one of the officers might recognize the place where it was taken. None of them do. The next morning, 
We had several copies made, and we began a search of bars along Fifth Street. We asked each bartender if he'd ever seen the man or the woman. In the first four places we checked, we got yes answers to the query about the woman, but none of the people we talked to could tell us anything about the man in the picture. Two more days passed without result. In the meantime, a warrant had been issued ordering the arrest of Rowena Telford, charging her with child neglect. A local and an APB were gotten out on her. On the third day after we started our search for the missing woman, we talked with a bartender who was able to give us the name of the man in the picture. He described the man as a fry cook in one of the smaller restaurants down on Fifth Street. We checked the restaurant but found that he had been fired on Monday, the 28th of January. A check of his home address gave us no indication as to where he might be. Irene and I went back to the office and checked the name through R&I. Joe? Yeah. Come up with anything? Check the name. He's registered on XC Bombay. Uh-huh. Where'd he fall? Back in Pennsylvania. He's signed for ADW. Well, we better talk to him, huh? Right now, he looks off the good. Why do you say that? But he was arrested for it? Yeah. He tried to beat a woman to death. We we'll learn more after this short commercial break. You're listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Jennifer, Jennifer! Oh, what, Carol? Oh, it's a catastrophe! I was trying to explain to my friend Claudia where to take her children for ballet lessons this summer. How is that a catastrophe? Well, I was going to recommend Coastal Ballet, but then I remember they moved from their studios in Foley. Still not seeing the problem. But I don't know where Madame Rio moved. Now Claudia's children will grow up without the benefit of learning from Madame Rio, and I just know they will end up on the street learning to dance from street gangs. And so they probably are going to jail, and who knows? They might even start twerking. <laughs> Calm down, Kara. Oh. Just tell Claudia she can take her kids to Coastal Ballet's new facility in Orange Beach. Madame Rio is accepting new students in the new studio in the Medical Arts Building at 4223 Orange Beach Boulevard, Highway 161. But, 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 but what about this summer? Coastal Ballet is offering a one-week summer incentive summer camp from July 6th through the 10th from 10 a.m. to 4, for ages 8 through 15. They'll be learning French, choreography, swimming, etiquette, and a Friday performance. All Claudia has to do is call Coastal Ballet at 251-979-9851. Oh, Jennifer, thank you so much. You may have saved Claudia's children from a life of crime. Oh, don't thank me. Thank Madame Rio and Coastal Ballet. And now we return to Dragnet, the big filth, a story of criminal child neglect and justice served. It's just the facts, ma'am. I always wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> An immediate search was started for the man in the picture with Rowena Telford. For friends of his, we found that he might be we might be able to locate him at a hamburger stand down in Santa Monica. Tuesday, February twelfth. Policewoman Irene Gardner and I go down to the beach. Should be it up there, huh? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah? We'd like to see Willis Thatcher. What for? Police officer, you're Thatcher, aren't you? Yeah. What do you want with me? A couple of questions we'd like to ask you. Sure. I ain't got nothing to hide. No reason to give you any trouble. Uh, uh, what do you want to know? You know a woman named Rowena Telford? Why do you ask that? It's a simple question, Thatcher. Can you give us the right kind of answer? How about it? Yeah, I know her. Why? What's she done now? When did you see her last? I don't know, a couple weeks ago. Narrow that down, will you? Why, listen. Anything she did, I had no part of. I understand you were pretty friendly with her. That's not true. Sure, maybe I had a couple of dates with her, not more than a couple. I mean, that's it. And anybody in the world could put up with her for more than that. Why'd you say a thing like that? You ever know her? No, we're looking for her. You? No, I've never met her. Hmm. Well, that's kind of something you can ask that kind of question. If you knew her, and you spent any time with her, you'd 
You had to know what I mean. Well, suppose you tell her. She's a lush. A real lush. All the time boozing it up. Wasn't so bad when she got loaded, but, but she was real loud when she was tanked up. Real loud. Is that right? Yeah, sure. Check around. Ask your friends. Talk to them. Well, I'll tell you the same story. Every one of them, first off, she'd have a couple of drinks, and the next thing you know, any fellow with her would be trying to, to get out of place with getting his head knocked off. She was always starting trouble. Sit down and order a drink, and next thing you know, some guy's asking you outside. Well, I ain't built to go outside too often. I get hurt bad when I fight. Uh huh. Do you have any other boyfriends? You don't listen very good, do you? What's that? I told you, isn't anybody around here had much to do with her? Uh, as far as I know, there wasn't nobody who went with her. How'd she seem last time you saw her? All right. Uh, she had a little hangover, but she always had one of those. Seems depressed about anything? Not that she talked about. Mm -hmm. You say anything about leaving town? Not to me. Listen, how about give me a break here? I'm telling what, uh, what this is. Tell me what this is all about. I mean, what are you after Rowena for? It's fight you told us about. You ever have any arguments with Mrs. Telford? I don't think that's any of your business. We're writing it down that it is. Now, how about an answer? Uh, we had a couple of beats, I told you. You couldn't go around with her and, and, and not have a little trouble. Did you have a house? Oh, we're back to that, huh? What do you mean? Well, you know the record. The time I did, you figured maybe I did something to Rowena. Isn't that it? You think I heard it? We're asking you. Well, you're way off the road. I ain't gonna try and con you. Sure, maybe I had a lot of reasons to want to belt her. I used to think a lot of her, Rita, an awful lot. But that's all over. All I wanted her to do was to leave me alone and stay away from me. I did never hit her. I didn't hurt her. No matter what you say. All right. You gotta believe that. I guess it sounds funny. I, I ain't trying to fool anybody. I'm ready to admit it. I'm a bum. Mm -hmm. She didn't have to keep telling me. Not all the time. I knew it. Yeah. Nobody likes to be called a bum. Mm -hmm. Even if you know it's true. 1.47 p.m. We drove the suspect over to his rooming house mm -hmm. and we checked the premises. We found nothing that would identify, that definitely would tie him in with the disappearance of the Telford woman. After leaving his room, we took him downtown where he was held for further investigation on a charge of suspicion of murder. We checked communications but found that there had been no word on the missing woman. Her name and description had been checked through the files and missing persons bureau without results. 3.40 p.m., Frank came by the office and said that the trial he was attending was dragging on and that it would be a couple more days before he'd be back on duty with me. A petition was filed on behalf of the children charging violation of section 273 APC, unfit home, asking that they be made wards of the juvenile court. Policewoman Irene Gardner put in a call to the next door neighbor of the Telford woman, but we found that there had been no trace of the missing woman since we removed the children. 5.12 p.m. We finished up the log for the day and we were leaving the office. I got it. Juvenile, Friday. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, what's that, what's that address? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, we'll be right there. Right, thank you. What do you got? Bar over on East Sixth. Yeah? Rowena Tilford just walked in. The bartender was one of those that we'd questioned when we first started the investigation. At the time, he knew the Telford woman, but said he hadn't seen her for several weeks. On the phone, he told me that she'd just walked into his bar. Irene Gardner and I left the office and drove over to the East Sixth Street address, but the woman had just left. We had her description and a description of her clothes that she was wearing. <laughs> and we put out an all cars through the area, but she was not picked up. Irene Gardner and I went back to the office and we put out a supplementary bulletin on the woman. At 8.14 p.m., we got a call from the woman who had made the original complaint, Mrs. Crystal Egger. She told us that the Telford woman had just walked into her own home. Irene and I left the office and we drove out to the house on Vallejo Street. Light on, but she must still be home. Yeah. Police officers would like to talk to you. Oh, just a minute. Well, it's about 
time you got here. You got them? I beg your pardon? You got the little brats? They all run off. Oh, I get my hands on them. They're going to get what for. Where are they? We have them downtown, Mrs. Selfie. Why didn't you bring them home? This is where they belong. When I get my hands on them, oh, I'm going to give that little... You mind if we come in? No, no, come right ahead. You've got to kind of excuse the way the house looks. I, I've been away for a couple of days. You can see how the kids can mess a place up. I'm Sergeant Friday. This is Miss Gardner. Oh, how do you do? Would you like to sit down? No, that's all right. How come you didn't bring them back? Being held in juvenile hall, Mrs. Selby. For what? Well, when we found them, they were suffering from malnutrition. And this Sorry. place here, it's not fit for youngsters. Oh, so you just took them out and put them in a hole? Is that the way it is? Yes, ma'am. That's the way it is. Well, you've got your nerve. You really have. What? You coming in here and breaking up my happy hole? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. We have a warrant for your arrest. Me? Yes, ma'am. Now you listen to me, cop. You got no right to come in here and break up my home. I know all about you, cop. All about you pussyfooting around, trying to make everybody think you're so good. I know what for you. I know what you are. And I'll tell you this. Yes, ma'am. What's that? You better get those kids back here real fast. Do you hear me? You get them back here fast. Because if you don't, I'm going to sue you and her and the city for every dime it's got. I'll take this to any court in the country. If I have to, I'm going to get my kids back. You ain't half as good as you think you are. You want it plain? Real plain so you can understand it? You think, that's what, all of you just think. All right, ma'am, I think that's enough of that. Uh, where have you been for the last two weeks? It was the most terrible thing that ever happened to me, to anybody. He told me he loved me. He said he was going to get married. I thought he'd be nice to the kids. That's what I thought for the kids. He was going to drive down to Mexico and get married all night. Mm -hmm. And everything was going nice. I gave Stevie a couple of dollars and told him to take care of things. Then we left. We drove all the way to San Diego without stopping. Then we had some lunch on the way to get married. And we had a couple of drinks just to make the food taste better. <laughs> That's all. Then all all of a sudden, I got sick again, and he walked out on me. He left me right there in the bar, all by myself. All the promises he made me, and all the things we was going to have, and all of it was a lot of lies. As soon as I got a little sick, we just had a couple of drinks, he walked out on me. Department 97 Superior Court of the State of California in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of the trial. Friends, we tried very hard to set a dragnet standard. Now to put that in just a few words, we try to make each program the kind of entertainment that you want. Well, we're going to keep working real hard. You know, the people who make Chesterfield feel the same way about their cigarettes. 
To sell a product, you have to make it good and keep it good. And the latest reports from our research lab shows that Chesterfield is highest in quality. Highest in quality. Low in nicotine. Smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette. Chesterfield. Regular or king size. They're mild. They're satisfying. They're best for me. <laughs> best for you! <laughs> Rowena Esther Talper was tried and convicted of violation of Section 273 APC, endangering the life and safety of a minor, which is punishable by imprisonment in the county jail for a period of not more than one year. The four Talper children were made wards of the juvenile court and were placed in foster homes. <laughs> Just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases in official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Music by Walter Schumann. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. And now, a 15-minute uh, intermission with some refreshments in the lobby, and after that, we'll be back for that screwball uh, comedy, My Man Godfrey. From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents My Man Godfrey. First, a word of thanks to you, our loyal listeners. It's because of your combined purchases of our products, Lux Toilet Soap and Lux Flakes, that we're able to bring you these programs. We take this opportunity to thank our, to express our gratitude to the National Women's Radio Committee, which, representing two million members of women's clubs the country over, has just voted the Lux Radio Theater the best dramatic program on the air. It's a gorgeous night on New York's waterfront. Softly, the moonlight tips the majestic spires of the Greensboro Bridge with a silvery glow, and comes gently to rest on a pile of refuse known as the city dump. In the center of this wasteland, a small fire is burning, and our man Godfrey, in tattered clothes, with a three-day growth of beard, sits on a packing case, warming his hands. A 16-cylinder motor purrs softly into the scene and comes to a stop. Three people alight. One of them, a young lady in evening clothes, steps gingerly toward the fire. Good evening. Good evening. How would you like to make five dollars? How would I? I didn't quite catch what you said. I said, how would you like to make five dollars? Well, I don't want to seem inquisitive, but what would I have to do for it? Oh, all you'd have to do is go to the Waldorf Ritz Hotel with me, and I'll show you to a few people, and then I'll send you right back. Uh, may I inquire just why you would want to show me to the people at the Waldorf Ritz? Well, if you must know, it's a game, a scavenger hunt. If I find a forgotten man first, I win. Is that clear? Oh, yes, quite clear. Uh, shall I wear my tails or come just as I am? You needn't be fresh. Do you want the five dollars or don't you? Madam, I can't tell you how flattered I am by your generous offer. What are you doing? Get uh, away from me! I am afraid I shall have to take it up with my board of directors. Don't you push me! And no matter what my board of directors advise, I think you will be spanked. Oh! <laughs> Knocks me down. You oh, deliberately oh, pushed oh, me oh, into that junk pile. Oh, I know I didn't, but it suited you nicely. George! George! I saw that. I saw what you did. Are you in the habit of hitting ladies? Maybe. I'm in the habit of hitting gentlemen also, if that would interest you. Don't touch me. George, aren't you going to do anything? I certainly am. I'm going to get a policeman. Come along. George! Come back here, George! Get in, dear. I'll show you that. Hello. Well, who are you? I'm Irene. That was my sister Cornelia. You pushed me into the ash pile. Uh, how would you like to have me push Cornelia's sister into the ash pile? Oh, I don't think I'd like it. Wait a minute. Are you a member of this hunting party? I was, but I'm not now. <laughs> the funniest thing, I couldn't help but laugh. You know, I've wanted to do that ever since I was six years old. You wanted to do what? Oh, push Cornelia into something. You know, pile of ashes or something. Cornelia thought she was going to win, and you pulled her into a bottle of ashes. Uh, 
Look, do you think you could follow an intelligent conversation for just a moment? Well, that's my opinion. Uh, do you mind telling me just what a scavenger hunt is? Oh, well, a scavenger hunt is exactly like a treasure hunt. Except in a treasure hunt, you find something that you want. In a scavenger hunt, you try to find something that nobody wants. And the ones who wins get the prize, only there really isn't a prize, because all the money goes to charity. That is, if there's any money left there, then they never lose. That clears the whole matter up beautifully. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm sorry to keep going. Should I? Uh, that's a good idea. I want to see who won the game. But well, I suppose it was Cornelia again. She's probably got another forgotten man by now. You mean if you took me along with you, that you'd win the game? Is that the idea? I might, but I think her. Let's beat Cornelia. She wouldn't be asking too much. Oh, not at all. I'm very curious. I'd really like to see just what a scavenger hunt looks like. But I just told you. Yes, but I'm still curious. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please, please, ladies and gentlemen, quiet, quiet, please. Your attention, please. Miss Bullock has the forgotten man. Oh, my. Here he is. Here he is. Uh, would you mind stepping up on the platform, please? <laughs> Doesn't he look funny? <laughs> Just uh, stand over there. Uh huh. Uh, between the monkey and the goat. <laughs> now, uh, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? By the way, what is your address? City Dump 32, East River, Sutton, please. <laughs> quiet, quiet, please, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, is that your permanent address? Well, the permanency is rather questionable. You see, the place is being rapidly filled in. Well, do you mind? Uh, may I ask you a personal question? If it isn't too personal. Are those whiskers your own? <laughs> well, no one else has claimed them. <laughs> Thank you. Now, one more question. Um, are you wanted by the police? Well, that's just the trouble. Nobody wants me. Oh. <laughs> A very good answer. Thank you, uh, The committee is satisfied. Miss Irene Bullock wins the scavenger hunt for the forgotten man. My purpose in coming here tonight was twofold. Uh, first, I wanted to aid this young lady. Uh, second, I was curious to see how a bunch of empty headed nitwits conducted themselves. The nerve! No. No. Oh, my curiosity is satisfied. I assure you, it will be a pleasure for me to go back to a society of really important people. Good night, you ladies and gentlemen. Oh, oh, wait, oh, wait. Oh, 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 I'm terribly sorry. Oh, that's all right. Oh, I never would have brought you here if I thought they were going to humiliate you. You know, I'm terribly grateful. It's the first time I've ever beaten Cornelia at anything, and you helped me do it. Oh, I wish there was something I could do for you. Why? Because you've done something for me, don't you see? Oh, well, I, uh, I could use a job if you've got one lying around loose. You rebuttal? Buttle? Yes, we're fresh out of butler, the one we had left this morning. <laughs> I'm afraid I wouldn't be much good at that. Oh, yes, you would. You're going to be the best butler we ever had. You really think so? Oh, I do. Well, uh... All right. Thank you. Good night, Miss Book. Well? Um, I beg your pardon. I am the, um... Uh... Yes, you're the new butler. Well, I'm the old maid. Come on in. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, how did you know I was the new butler? Uh, there's one here every morning at this hour. They're dropping in and out all the time. Is the family that exacting? No, they're that nutty. I see. Uh, does the butler have quarters here in the house, or is it necessary? You won't need any quarters. Just hang your hat near the door so you can grab it quickly on your way out. What's that? Oh, that's the old battle axe. She usually rings about this time. The old battle axe? Yeah, Mrs. Bullock. She's the mother type. If she has the jitters, and she usually does, she'll ring again in a minute in no uncertain terms. Then, brother, you better grab her tomato juice and get going. Uh, well, there she goes. Well, Cupid, this is your big opportunity. Uh, shall I take it to her? Yeah, but you, um, you, uh, you might as well know the worst. Uh, I, I want to warn you, she, um, she's pixies. Pixies? 
Simon Burrell. You were very amusing. I'm very sorry, miss. Oh, I don't mind at all. Have you a handkerchief? There's a spot on my shoe. Will you see what you can do about it? Of course, miss. I could have you fired, you know, but I like to see things wriggle. When I get through with you, you'll go back to your packing case on the city dump and relish it. I'll make your life so miserable. Hello, Godfrey. Uh, good evening, Miss Irene. Oh, I like you very much. Uh, thank you for picking it up. Well, how do you like when you round the dump? Well, I think they're uh, very nice. Uh, thank you. I heard what you said, Godfrey. So what? So what, you leave him alone. So who's going to make me leave him alone? If you don't, you'll get a good sock from me. Ooh, the physical type. What I say goes. May I come in? You're in, aren't you? Good evening, Irene. Oh, hello, Carla. I've just been reading a very interesting book, The Greeks of the Middle Ages. Irene would like that. You love the Middle Ages, don't you, dear? Shut up. Well, here we are. Um, uh, hello, Mrs. Bullock. Come on, Mr. Vecchi. Russia, for how do you do? Oh, Carlo, you're so continental. Oh, it's so nice to see you two girls having a pleasant chat. Or is it a pleasant chat? Well, well, well. Imagine the bullocks gathered together all in one room. Oh, don't forget Carlo, Alexander. Oh, I'm not going to forget Carlo. Oh, don't bother about me, Mr. Bullock. I feel one of the party. And then you don't mind if I discuss a few family matters, do you, Carla, my boy? Oh, no, no, not at all. Oh, Alexander, you're not going to bring up those sordid business matters again, I hope. I've just been going over last month's bill. And I tell you that you people have confused me with the Treasury Department. Oh, don't start that again, Dad. I've got to start it. The way you people are throwing my money around. Oh, money, money, money. That Frankenstein monster. Destroyed. What? What? Say, listen, I... Please don't say anything more about it. You're upsetting Carlo. Oh, Carlo, Carlo, Carlo. Who's the head of this house, Carlo or me? Shh, here's Godfrey. Uh, your cocktail, sir. Ah, uh, well, thank you, Godfrey. Uh, not at all, sir. Miss Irene. Oh, did you help to make them, Godfrey? I helped. Well, they must be wonderful. I'd like to help sometime if you'd let me. I feel honored. While we're on the subject, how about this business of certain people picking up anybody they find on the city dump and dragging them into the house? For all we know, we might be stabbed in the back some night and robbed. Who's going to stab you, Cornelia? We don't know a thing about certain people. Shut up. I will not shut up. My life is precious to me. It won't be in a minute. I think we should get our help from employment agencies. Well, I don't know but what I agree with Cornelia. What? Why are you? Irene? Where's Godfrey? He's 
right here. Oh, don't go away, Godfrey. Angelica, we'll be late for the concert. I've got my things. I'll be right with you. Godfrey's right here, darling. Well, right here. Look, look. See, darling, Godfrey. Say hello to Irene so she'll know you are here. Hello. Oh, hello, Godfrey. And he's promised to stay on, haven't you, Godfrey? If I'm on. Oh, of course you're wanted, isn't he, Irene? Yes. Go away. Oh, yes, darling, I'm going. <laughs> Goodbye, darling. <laughs> Come along, Paolo. Hurry. Oh, hurry, 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 always hurry. <laughs> oh, Godfrey. Yes, miss. <clears throat> Sit down, Godfrey. Oh, no, 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 it's on you. Oh, uh, <clears throat> yes, um, thank you, miss. Godfrey, would you mind kissing me? Oh, uh, miss Irene, I hardly think that. Oh, Godfrey. Here, here. No, no, wait now. Wait, wait, please. Miss, I... Miss, I think you must. Oh, dear. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, Godfrey, come back. Where are you going? I'm going to my room. Oh, Godfrey, wait for me. Godfrey? 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 Godfrey, open this door. Oh. Godfrey? Oh, there you are, Godfrey. Please, Miss Irene, you, you, you can't come in here. Why not? It's our house, isn't it? And after all, one room is just like any other room. Besides, I want to talk. I'm terribly sorry, but uh, we, we can't talk here. Now, don't you think it's rather indecent of you to order me out after you've kissed me? After I kissed you? <laughs> no, of course, Godfrey, don't you? Uh, Miss Irene, hasn't anyone ever told you about certain proprieties? Oh, you use such lovely big words. I like big words. What does it mean? Uh, well, um, you want me to stay on here as butler, don't you? Well, of course. And I want to justify your faith in me by being a very good butler, and in time, perhaps filling the void created by the death of your late lamented Pomeranian. Oh, I forgot all about him. He is pleased anyway. Besides, you're different. You use big words and you're much cuter. Uh, may I tell you a story? Absolutely. Well, once there was a very sentimental little girl with a very kind heart, and she helped a man who was very grateful. But then she became a nuisance and undid all the fine work she had ever done. Her name is Irene Bullock, and if she were a smart little girl, she'd pick out some nice young chap in her social set and marry him and live happily ever after and never, never, never enter the butler's room again. You mean I can never, never, never come in here again? Never. Now out you go. Oh, no, Godfrey, no! Now just wait, please. No, I want to stay. Let me go. Outside, please. Oh, you'll be sorry. And don't ever come in here again. You'll be sorry. <laughs> So ends Act One of Fine Man Gun. In a moment, our stars will be back for Act Two. Jennifer! Jennifer! What is the matter, Kara? Oh, it's Claudia again! Oh no. Not her kids. Don't tell me they started twerking. <laughs> <laughs> Even worse, it's her husband, Claude. He's leaving her. Leaving her? Mm. But Claude is crazy about Claudia. He'd never break up their happy home. I tell you, he's leaving her. He's leaving her and he's going out with the guys. The guys? The guys. He's bored and just sitting around the house every night, and he's leaving her. Hmm. Oh. What they need is something different. Tell Claudia to bring him to South Bowen Community Theater for the rest of the season. <laughs> Coming up this next weekend is Songs of the South, a hilarious musical. Then in April, Claude can treat the whole family to the Wizard of Oz. And in May, come enjoy Shakespeare, an evening with the Bard. And then there's Summertide Theater with Smoke on the Mountain Homecoming from the University of Alabama in May and June. Then, I'm directing the 6th Annual Short Play Festival in July. And the season wraps up at the end of July and August with a double feature, Fantastic Mr. Fox with James and the Giant Peach. Oh, I'm sure Claude and Claudia had no idea there was so much to see at the South Baldwin Community Theater. And the whole family can get involved and become part of a wonderful theater community. Why are you crying? Oh, I'm so happy. I think you just saved their marriage. Thank you so much. Don't thank me. 
Thanks, South Bowen Community Theater, by buying tickets and telling everyone. <laughs> And now, once again, my man Godfrey. Two days have passed during which Irene has shown an all too evident affection for her man Godfrey. In the Bullock living room, a cocktail party is in progress. Irene, dressed in mourning, watches with tragic eyes as Godfrey moves among the guests. Now, let me see, what did I spin? I never can tell the difference between spades and chocolates. Uh, some hors d'oeuvres, Mr. Wolf. Oh, yes, thank you, Godfrey. Well, hello, everybody. Oh, look, it's Tommy Gray, the polo player. Tommy, come over here. Irene, Cornelia, look who's here. Look who's here, dear. How are you, Angelica? Oh, I'm fine. Godfrey, where are you going? Don't go away. Oh, uh, sorry. Give Mr. Gray some hors d'oeuvres, Godfrey. Uh, very good, madam. Uh, Mr. Gray? Why, thank you. I well, live in Godfrey Park. Uh, Smith, sir. Godfrey Smith. Smith? Huh. What do you mean, Smith? Do you know Godfrey, Tommy? Know him? We went to Harvard together. Oh, imagine. A butler with a college education. Butler? Huh. Is this a gag? Uh, and Mr. Gray neglected to tell you that when we were in Harvard together, I was in that ballet. Was he a good servant, Tommy? Oh, uh, excellent. Uh, what is all this, Doctor? I'll tell you later. Strange you never get, gave Mr. Gray as a reference, Godfrey. Uh, well, you see, uh, I left Mr. Gray under very unusual circumstances. Oh, what circumstances? I'd uh, rather Mr. Gray told you about them. <laughs> Yes, go ahead, Tommy. Tell us. Tell us. Yes. Uh, 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 well, uh, you see, Godfrey here was working for us as a butler, and so forth, and things were going well, uh, very well. But one day, um, are you sure you didn't want to tell us, Godfrey? Oh, I'd so much rather you would, Mr. Gray. Oh, well, uh, well, Godfrey was working for us for quite some time, and one day he came to me and said, Mr. Gray, <laughs> he said, uh, I trust my work here has been satisfactory, and, and I said, oh, why, of course. I, I, I said, I've, I've never had more satisfactory work in all my life. And he said, uh, why, thank you, sir. He was always very courteous, Dr. Work. And then he left? Yeah, he, um, what? Oh, yes, yes, yes. He decided he had to leave. Why? Well, he decided in favor of his wife and five children. Five <laughs> children? Dr. Work. Uh, you never asked, Miss Irene. Well, all I've got to say is other people do have five children. So can other people. Listen, everybody, I want to make an announcement. I want to announce something. I, I, want, to, I want to announce my engagement. Yes, that's who it is, Johnny Van Serving hors d'oeuvres, 
There must be a story. Oh, yes, there is. How many do you remember that little incident up in Boston? Oh, you still have that woman on your mind. Uh, no, not anymore, but I was pretty bitter at the time. I gave her everything I had. She just disappeared. And? Well, Tommy, it's surprising how fast you can go downhill when you begin to feel sorry for yourself. Boy, did I feel sorry for myself. I wandered down the East River one night, thinking that I'd just slide in and get it over with. But I met some fellows living down there on the city stump. Fellows who were fighting it out and not complaining. My eyes never got as far as the water. What happened? I did all sorts of things to learn just to live. And then, well, then something happened. I got a chance to take this job, bottling. A chance to rehabilitate myself. And I took it. And that's all? And that's all. Uh, but someday, Tommy, I'm going to do some rehabilitating around that stump. That's why I'm glad I met you. Me? Oh, you're going to help too. Excuse me, Mr. Gray. Yes. You're wanted on the phone, sir. Uh, I'll be right back, Tom. Radio. Good afternoon, Godfrey. Oh, um, good afternoon, Miss Cordelia. May I sit down? Well, the mystery's solved, isn't it? The mystery, Miss Cordelia? Yes. Now I know what a butler does on his day off. When you worked for Mr. Gray, were the two of you always this chummy? As you see, I worked for Mr. Gray for a long time. I see, I see. Well, if you can be so chummy with the Grays, why can't you be chummy with the Bullock? I try to keep my place. Why? You're very attractive, you know. As a butler? No, as a smith. You're a rotten butler. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Are we going to be friends? I feel that on my day off, I just have to sit and keep you with my friends. You can't go on like this forever. If you really like me, you're afraid to admit it, aren't you? You want me to tell you what I really think? Please do. Don't hold it against me. It's your day off. Very well. Miss Cornelia, you belong to that unfortunate category I would call the Park Avenue brat. A spoiled child who's grown up in ease and luxury, who always had her own way, and whose misdirected energies are so childish that they hardly deserve the comments of even a butler on his off Thursday. Thank you for a very lovely portrait. Goodbye for now. I'll see you down by the ash pile. Waiter? Yes, sir? Uh, change that order. Make it two stingers. Doubles. Molly? Yes, Miss Irene? What are you doing? Sewing. Some buttons on his coat. Oh, is it his coat? Yes. The coat is his. You know, I'd like to sew some buttons on sometime when they come off. I wouldn't mind at all. I could do it right down here in the kitchen. He doesn't lose very many. He's very tidy, isn't he? Yes, he's he's very tidy. What do you do on your day off? He never tells me. Well, He's probably sitting somewhere with a woman on his lap. Yes! <laughs> he's a mean man, I know. I think mean, he's very mean. I suppose he's sitting somewhere with someone on his lap. He doesn't care for him at all. Yes, probably. As far as I know, maybe his children are there too. Probably just, oh, I can't bear it. Oh, no. Oh, you too? That's what we'll do. That's the idea. Call the police. 
The G men. Uh, give me the first. You don't have to bother. I've already called them. And I think I know who did it. In fact, I'm almost sure. What do you say, Godfrey? I uh <laughs>
Oh, you let me do something if I ask you. Well, uh, what do you want to do? What? Oh, well, uh, all right then. And you can tell me all about your trip. Oh, and you won't get mad? Well, why should I? Because every place I went, everybody was God. Everybody was God. Now, I don't want to seem dull, but I do have a little trouble following you at times. Well, for instance, whenever I go into a restaurant in Paris or any place, I close my eyes and I say, the waiter is Godfrey, and I say, I'm home, and he's serving me dinner, and well, I have everything tastes better. We went to Venice one night, and I went for a ride in one of those robots, man pushes with a stick. Not a matador, that would be insane. Something like a matador. Uh, do you by chance mean a gondola? Oh, yeah. The name of the boat, and then push it and bang, it looks just like you. Oh, it was wonderful. I didn't even mind the smell. <laughs> uh, look, uh, do you mind if I talk for a bit while you catch your breath? Oh, right. While you've been away, I've been doing some things also. I've been trying to do some things that I thought would make you proud of me. Oh, I've proud of you before I went away. Oh, yes, but uh, I mean prouder still. You see, you helped me find myself, and I'm very grateful. Oh, you're a wonderful husband. Oh, well, I'm, I'm afraid not. Uh, you're just grateful to me because I helped you beat Cornelia, and I'm grateful to you because you helped me to beat life. But that doesn't mean we have to fall in love. Well, you don't want to, but I'd make a wonderful wife. Well, um, not, uh, not for me, I'm afraid. But we are friends, and I feel a certain responsibility to you, and that's why I wanted to tell you first. Tell me what? Well, I thought it was about time I was moving on. Oh, Godfrey! Oh, no, 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 please. I won't cry, I promise. Ah, uh, now that's fine. After all, I'm your protege, and you want me to improve myself, don't you? Yes. Well, that's very sweet. Well, when are you leaving? Oh, pretty soon. Uh, but I'll call you up every now and then. We'll have some long chats, and I'll tell you how I'm getting along, and we'll have lots of fun. So you're going back to her? To whom? Your wife. Why? Oh, ho, ho, ho. Uh, well, she was just a fabrication. Well, then you're not married? Oh, of course not. And there aren't five children? Well, there couldn't very well be. Could oh, God, we have to go for me. Did you ring, Miss Cornelia? Come in, Godfrey. You needn't be so formal when we're alone. Yes, Miss. There's a little matter I'd like to talk over with you. I met some people on the boat coming over, a Boston family. They know a great deal about a family called the Parks. Are you interested, Godfrey? In a slightly, yes. Well, we can't talk here very well. Let's you and I take a long taxi ride out Van Cortland way. I heard what you said. Did you? He's not going out with you. <laughs> yes, he is. If he knows what's good for him. I'll be waiting, Godfrey. He's not going. He's not. He's not. Godfrey, you can't go out with Cornelia. But I didn't say I was going any place with Miss Cornelia. I know, but you will. She always gets her way. Makes everybody do just as she likes. Now, why should you care whether I meet her or not? I do care. That's why. Cornelia is the one who doesn't. But I think I should decide those things for myself. Oh, Godfrey, I mean, I don't want to be annoying, but... Oh, oh Miss Irene. Here, here now. Get up. Get up. Open your eyes. Do you hear me? Open your eyes. Now, if you're faking another spell, you're on the wrong track. Are you faking? Oh, you're not, Tom. All right. We'll soon find out. Uh, <clears throat> now, off she goes. Ah, there's the girl. Now, I'll just carry her inside. Godfrey knows how to take care of little Irene when she fakes. Godfrey will take care of everything. Right in. Here we go. A nice cold shower will fix you up. <laughs> oh, Godfrey, go back here! Godfrey, where are you? Godfrey! Godfrey! Oh. 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 Irene, stop running around all wet! Oh, Mother, how about she loves me? What? No, oh, Godfrey loves me! He put me in the shower! Godfrey loves me! He loves me! Godfrey put me in the shower! <laughs> Godfrey! <laughs> on the second act of My Man Godfrey. We pause for station identification. This is SBCT, South Baldwin Community Theater, at the Erie Meyer Performing Arts Center on the Columbia Broadcasting System. It's the following afternoon. In the Bullock living room, Carlos strums idly on the piano, while Mrs. Bullock and Cornelia listen inattentively. 
Mr. Bullock, entering from the hall, surveys the scene gloomily. What you told you? What you told you? Shut up! What? What did you say? I told him to shut up. Well, I never. And you can shut up with him. And you too, Cornelia. I didn't open my mouth. Well, don't. Listen and listen carefully. It's what the clerk made to repeat it. The bullocks are broke. What? I'm broke. You are broke. She is broke. We are all broke. Not only that, but I've been using the company's money for the last month to speculate with, and I've lost. You hear me? I, I, I've lost. That means I'm an embezzler. Unless I get hold of a lot of money by the first of the month, I'm going to jail. Now, isn't that an interesting story? Well, I certainly <coughs> think it was very foolish of you. You had no right to do it. An ambassador. And to think I have been a guest in your house. Is there nothing left? Not a cent. Ah, your food and drink have turned dust in my mouth. What? <laughs> oh, that settles it. Ah, Carlo, would you uh, step into the hall for a moment? Uh, what for? Well, I, I want to speak to you as a man to man. Uh, you have found a way out? Yes, yes. For one of us, anyhow. This way, Carlo. Uh, excuse me, please. Uh, well? Alexander, what are you doing out there? Alexander, Cornelia, what are they doing? Oh, Alexander, come here, come here. What did you say to Carlo? I said goodbye. Did he go? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. He looked very hurriedly by the side window. <laughs> Alexander, you're cruel. Uh, did I hear something fall, sir? Yes, you did. Godfrey, come here. Carlo is gone. Who is he? Don't you don't even seem surprised. I think I've been expecting it. We all have to go sooner or later. Yes, that's true, isn't it? <laughs> you're so smart, Godfrey. <laughs> Maybe you can tell me why Mr. Bullock has to go to jail, sir. <laughs> well, I'm sure that Mr. Bullock doesn't have to go to jail. Oh, well, yes, I, I do. Oh, no, sir. Uh, you see, I've known for some time that the Bullock's interests were in rather a bad way. How did you know that? Oh, I followed the market quite a bit. Uh, so I took the liberty of dabbling in some stock on my own account. Here, sir. Uh, well, uh, what's this? That is most of your stock. I knew it was being dumped on the market, so I sold short. Short? You mean gentlemen short? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, uh, do, do, do you mean that you've been making money while I was losing it? Well, I did it in your interest, sir. Oh. I felt I owed your family a debt. I hope I repaid it. And I may add, some of the money went into a project of my own. I hope you won't mind, sir. You mean you did all that on $150 a month? <laughs> well, hardly. Uh, you see, with the aid of Tommy Gray and uh, Miss Cornelia's pearls. Uh, here, Miss Cornelia. Oh, Godfrey, then you did steal them after all. Well, um... I... I put the pearls under Godfrey's mattress. Thank you, Miss Cornelia. I wanted you to say that. Here, Godfrey, these pearls are rightfully yours. Oh, no, thank you. I've repaid my debt. And I'm grateful to you all. If anyone's indebted, we are after the way some of us have treated you. Oh, I've been repaid in many ways. I learned patience from Mr. Bullock. I found Mrs. Bullock at all times, shall we say, um, amusing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's very complimentary of you, Godfrey. What good did you find in me, if any? A great deal. You taught me the fallacy of false pride. You taught me humility. I don't understand you. Miss Cornelia, there have been other spoiled children in the world. I happen to be one of them myself. You're a high-spirited girl. I only hope that you will use those high spirits in a more constructive way. And so, goodbye. Oh, oh dear. Oh, dear. Oh, there goes a great guy. Hello. Hello, Irene. What's the matter? Nothing. What's the matter with Miss Cornelia? I don't know. 
What's the matter with everybody? What's everybody crying about? Godfrey's gone. Gone? Gone where? He didn't say. Why didn't you stop him? Why didn't you hold him here? He couldn't. Well, he's not going to get away from me. Where are you going? The city dump. <laughs> Well, this is it, Tommy. Come in, Colin. A palace of pleasure built on the foundation of sands and ashes. A yeah, Just a minute, Godfrey. Is this where my money went? Into a nightclub? Oh, some of yours, all of mine. Uh, come into my office. By the way, what happens to the profits from this place? Well, we're giving food and shelter to 50 people in the winter and giving them employment for the summer. Uh, what more do you want? Uh, nothing. But you're the most peculiar butler that I've ever met. Uh, Ex-butler. Fired? <coughs> no, I, I quit. I felt that um, foolish feeling coming on again. Oh, you mean Irene. Why don't you marry her? Oh, no, thank you. Being her butler was tough enough.